Okay. Well, Nathan said that um, he invited three kinds of people, and I suppose that I may count as a fourth since um, I fall to the category of random guy that he happens to know. I'm not really a sinologist. Um, by training originally, um, I'm a Japanologist, actually, but I stopped doing that a long time ago. In fact, I stopped doing linguistics formally a long time ago. I, this is actually my comeback. I haven't had a job in, in <coughs> academia in 11 years. Um, so, coming in as a sort of outsider, this talk will be somewhat unorthodox in that it, it will be in two parts. The first part is, is sort of a cautionary and autobiographical story, which is relevant, don't worry. Um, and if you know anything about how Maltese is spelled, that's a big clue right there, the GH. Um, and this will tie into uh, my remarks on um, old Chinese reconstruction in the second half. Um, I prepared this talk thinking that some of you may not be super familiar with old Chinese reconstruction and all the decades of wars and arguments about it. So for some of you, this may be rather boring. But I'd like to provide some background anyway, at least from my my experience. When I first started learning about Chinese phonology um, in the early 90s, my only exposure to it was through the works of Bernard Colgren. I borrowed every Colgren book I could find in the library and I, I regarded it as like a religion. I just totally believed it. And in the Colgren, in Colgren and Colgren type systems of old Chinese reconstruction, there are two kinds of syllables that in the notation I use here, which is not Colgren's, one type, which I will call after Pulley Blank, who came after Colgren, A, has no yod or J in it. And type B has a yod that is a J in it. Um, I'll be using this color coding throughout this PowerPoint presentation. So red means type A, blue means type B. Now, for decades, this is, this is the reconstruction that people outside Sonology used. If you look at Japanology stuff, if you look at, look at Korean studies stuff, you will see that Cogren stuff is still religiously quoted today as if um, Baxter Cigar had never happened, which really, really irritates me. But <laughs> that's the way it is. And that's that, like I said, I, I originated as a Japanologist, so this is, this is where I started from. I was totally unaware of Baxter 1992 even as I was reading these books by Colbert, I had just no idea. I mean, in Japanese studies, nobody mentioned it. <coughs> then I started looking around, and I discovered other interpretations of A and B. Um, Pulley Blank, in 1962, interpreted A and B in terms of vowel length. There have been other interpretations since. I'm not going to list them here. Um, I mean, I'm not going to. I list them here, but I'm not going to read them. I just want to, I just don't, you don't even have to read this. I just want to point out that there's been lots and lots of ideas about what, what A and B are. Now, in 1995, one of my Japanese professors sent me a um, Journal of the American Oriental Society article by Norman from 1994. And he said, oh, Mark, I think you'd be interested in reading this. So I said, OK. So, and, and he thought it was so important that this is pre-internet, right? So he mailed it to me in an envelope to my house. And I opened it up, and I was absolutely shocked. Um, I had never seen anything quite like this before. According to Norman, um, old Chinese had three kinds of syllables. Yes, you see two here. I know it says three up there. Bear with me. What I've been calling A and B corresponds to Norman's pharyngealized consonants and his plain consonants. Norman has a third type that I'm going to ignore, which is his retroflex class. This, I only have half an hour to speak, so I just can't go into this. <coughs> so for our purposes, I'm going to concentrate on the pharyngealized versus plain distinction that Norman proposed. So this is 1995. 
I had just started to emerge out of the whole Kalbranian religion. And this to me just came as just total heresy, unbelievable, bizarre. And Norman wrote that um, in his theory, his idea was that if a syllable is plain, that is, it has no pharyngealization, it will develop a palatal medial unless pharyngealization blocks this palatal. <coughs> now, he, his argument was based on, was partly based on Arabic. This absolutely blew my mind at the time. Now the crazy thing is, is that at the t I had to take I, I took a course in which I was introduced to Arab Arabic phonology, morphology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you would have thought I would have been receptive, and this is why I say this is a cautionary tale. I did have the <laughs> Arabic knowledge, but in my mind it was severed from all this East Asian stuff. So I didn't want to listen to Norman. I, I just thought this just cannot possibly be relevant. It didn't help also that Norman possibly due to space constraints or something. They didn't really explain his Arabic argument as much as he could have. And so he didn't get any specific example. And so to me, this just seemed really bizarre. And moreover, by this point, since I was emerging out of the whole Kalbranian religion, I had started to question the whole concept of the Yaw being the defining characteristic of the AB distinction. And at that point, I thought, well, Norman still believes in this Yad stuff, even not at the old Chinese level, but at a later level. And since I was becoming skeptical of this Yad stuff, thanks to Pulley Blank, I was starting to switch religions from Calgary to Pulley Blank. <laughs> um, I was like, well, th th this just can't possibly be right. What good could these supposed parallels of Arabic be if almost all this parallelization didn't even exist, as Pulley Blank had been arguing? So I just totally put this in a file and kind of forgot about it. So that was 1995. So for years, I just played almost totally agnostic about the AB distinction. I was certain that it did not involve J. I was not convinced by the other hypotheses like vowel length that had been proposed. Basically, I had no real idea. I mean, I, I just rejected some ideas, but um, for me, it was an algebraic thing. Now, in 2000, uh, Wolfgang Baer um, showed me a uh, unpublished list of later Han Chinese reconstructions by Axel Schussler. This completely blew my mind. Um, until then, I had switched religions again from point blank to Saracen. And so I was a big believer in Saracen's 1989 book and its reconstruction. And um, in the unpublished version of my PhD dissertation, Saracen is quoted all over the place. If you've seen my 2003 book, I chopped out a lot of that stuff. Um, Saracen's old Chinese reconstruction, looking back, strikes me as really complicated. I actually wrote diagrams for myself to try to make sense out of it. What stunned me about Schussler was that his, his, his account of Chinese historical phonology was so simple. And it just struck me as incredibly elegant. Here's what I mean by elegant. Now, you may be thinking, what? Why are you talking about, well, keep, well, bear with me. One of the key concepts of Schussler that I just fell in love with instantly, yep, it's religion changing time again, um, was what I'll call vowel bending. In Schuster's system, vowels warp or bend. Um, in Schuster starts off with a six vowel system. That is pretty much familiar <coughs> to anyone who's worked with um, Zheng Zhang or Straussin or Baxter Cigar. So this is the starting point. Bending refers to how, in the, during the history of Chinese, these simple vowels become more complex. In A-type syllables, and at this point in 2000, I didn't know what A-type was. I just said, I don't know. Um, high vowels bent down. And low, low vowel, lower vowels stayed low. They're already low, and you really can't. They, and it's like you can't push them any lower. 
Conversely, in type B syllables, and again, I, at this point, I didn't know what type B really was, we have the opposite change where lower vowels are pulled upward. And vowels that are already high more or less stay high. We can argue the phonetic specifics here. The, the point is, is that the two different types of syllables are associated with two different kinds of warping patterns. The details of these patterns are arguable, could have varied by dialect, who knows. Now, <coughs> what impressed me was that these, these warpings or bendings were reminiscent to me of Khmer. Now, in Khmer, one could, in, could try to project Chinese-style terminology, do not do this, but, but just for the next two minutes, just bear with me. In Khmer, you could claim that there are two kinds of syllables. In Khmer, the type A syllables are, have voiceless consonants originally, and the type B syllables had voice consonants originally. In the type A consonants in Khmer, you have the same kinds of bendings as in type A in Chinese. And similarly with type B. Now in Khmer, again, the conditioning factor is the voicing of the initial consonant. This is not a factor in Chinese. So the parallels stop there. But what struck me as neat was the, was the patterns of bending. So Schuessler's proposal struck me not only as elegant, but also as typologically highly plausible. I am not trying to say that these two phenomena are related in any way that Khmer is influenced by Chinese or anything. This is just a pure typological uh, comparison. These did not even happen in remotely the same era, which is why I have older versus newer. The Khmer phenomenon happened perhaps with, per, happened within the last millennium, long after this happened in Chinese. The point is just that the vowel patterns are quite similar. And that in both cases you have a two you have a two-way distinction that is characterized in the later stage by different patterns of bending. Now, if we take this bending as a fact, and the question becomes, what makes this happen? At this point in 2000, I was agnostic. I had no idea. Something was pushing down and something was pushing all up. But what was it? I didn't know. Now, what I call the Maltese moment happened in the University of Leiden, <coughs> the Leiden University Library. Um, I was looking through linguistics books there at random one day with no real purpose at all. I just grabbed some book that had the word Maltese on it on the side. I mean, this is just completely thoughtless. I opened it up, and again, completely at random, I, 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 I happened to be on the section of phonology. <laughs> and it pointed out that in Maltese, historically, where you had earlier Arabic pharyngeal, this earlier, and the earlier Arabic uvular, the vowels bent in the same way that the Chinese did. More or less. For our purposes for the next couple of minutes, we can call this Maltese type A. <laughs> now, in Maltese words that didn't have these, the, this pharyngeal or this uvula, these back, these very back consonants, you have Chinese-like bendings in the other direction. So eyes bent upwards to ye. This phenomenon in Arabic is called Imala. Norman mentioned it in his article, but he didn't say what it was. And I had read about Imala a couple of years ago in another article in Arabic, but because of the wall in my brain, I just refused to put the two things together. The shock of seeing this in Maltese and the Schuster article all within a matter of weeks just set my brain on fire. If Norman had mentioned a specific example of Imala in his article, it might have told me five years earlier, but no. So now that I actually saw what Imala looked like, I was really excited. I, I, I thought, wow, look at this. Pharyngeal's conditioning vowel lowering. So I concluded that Imala was happening in Chinese. And not that should surprise me because Imala means bending, which is exactly what I've been showing you for the last few minutes. 
But at this point, I still don't know. Right? But it's, and at this point, I started to think, now I finally know what A and B is. A is characterized by fertilization. I, I would rather use the vaguer term that some Arab, Arabic linguists use, emphasis, because there's a huge literature on emphasis in Arabic. <clears throat> and there's this huge debate on whether it involves fungalization or uvularization or this or that. And, I mean, there's just books on this. And I prefer using the vaguer term because when we deal with an extinct language, we cannot pretend to write exact IPA transcriptions of what it was. I mean, so all that matters to me is that these emphatic consonants, as I'll call them, are somehow different from the others. The exact details of this, was it where they velarized or whatever, I think um, <clears throat> are open to debate. So from this point on, I'll mostly use this vaguer term emphasis deliberately. <clears throat> now, note my next question. I've answered one question. Where, where does type A come from? Type B being non-emphatic. I'm pretty certain of that now. I've been certain of that for 15 years. Um, I've been looking into, um, <clears throat> into um, semiotic historical phonology and just stunned by stuff I see. <clears throat> so now, the, the next, for the next 15, for the 15 years after this, then, the question for me became, what was the source of this, all this for Is it primary or is it secondary? Has it always been there? <clears throat> So in part two now, I'm going to get more hardcore in the Chinese and less biographical. Oh, I was hoping to do that. <coughs> I made the mistake of not drinking anything during the break. <clears throat> now, we have the key of Maltese, we have the pharyngealization <coughs> as the source of type A. It's symbolized by my T there. So what happens when we unlock this door? What awaits us next? What's behind the, the door in Maltese? An example of work or banking itself. <clears throat> now, rereading Norman 1994 with a more open mind than I had years earlier, I noticed this, that a two-way two division of words is a common phenomenon all over the Eurasian continent. This made me think, rethink the whole question in terms of a real typology. Now, one characteristic of the new Baxter cigar reconstruction that strikes, that strikes me and possibly others that's very unusual, is the huge system of 36 emphatic consonants, or pharyngealized or whatever you, as you may prefer. All of these consonants have type B or non-emphatic counterparts, except for this rare one there. I don't know of any language which has more emphatics than non-emphatics. Now, for some time, I was at, I tried to reconceivable Chinese with fewer emphatics than this. And I will confess, I failed. I, I can't really beat this system. So I'm going to take this as a given, what you see here. I do know that more and more over, the more I thought about it, this isn't as crazy as I thought it was initially. I do know of languages with similarly structured constant inventories. So typologically, this is not as bad as it looks. When looking into Semitic, um, I found, a, I found um, the work of Islam Yusuf, who writes a lot about the Arabic of Cairo. Now, in a description of standard Arabic, you have very, very few emphatics. Yusuf's description of Cairo in Arabic is stuffed with emphatics. There are 23 of them. And they have near total symmetry with the non-emphatics. So superficially, this almost looks like the old Chinese inventory. 
However, there is a key dis difference, though. Most of these emphatics are allophones of non-emphatics and not phonemes. Most of these emphatics are predictable. They are conditioned by the five true emphatics and by, and by something else which I will mention shortly. The point, though, is that it is possible to have a language with tons and tons of emphatics, and it's spoken right now. It's just that, I, I mean, this just probably eludes people because, of course, there's no way in the Arabic script to write all these emphatics. But my assumption is, is that if you try to pronounce Kyrene Arabic without them, you'll sound really bizarre. Norman mentioned Russian, and I think <coughs> Russian put me off at the time, 1995, because, I, because of, in the Russian, the two-way distinction is between palatalized and non-palatalized. Norman described the Russian non-palatalized consonants as phrasalized. Um, I don't know if I would agree with that. But once again, we have near total symmetry. And this time, like Baxter and Sagar, both counties, most, most of these pairs really are phonemic. But like I just said, the, the Russian distinction involves palatalization, and old Chinese generally <coughs> doesn't. It is true that some type B syllables palatalize in late old Chinese, but unlike the Calgarians, I don't define type B as palatalized. So there are limits to these parallels of Russian. A third example that I studied after I initially read Norman's article was Old Turkic. Old Turkic is written in a runic script, and it too has, and it too has a two-way opposition. But there is no phonemic opposition between them. So the point is, is that these systems demonstrate that the Baxter cigar system is not typologically as odd as it may seem at first. And I will stop there. Without actually going into all the original stuff I put at the end. Uh, you, can, you can just take it out of question time. Yeah. So, so I think if you have further, get through your slides. Really? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Now, what all the three previous systems have in common is this. These large systems, Turkic, Russian, and Chinese Arabic, derive either diachronically or synchronically from a less complex system. <coughs> in, in the case of Old Turkic, the Baptist and Fret, the, the, the two types of consonants are entirely predictable. In Kyrene, most of them are predictable. And it is true that palatalization is currently phonemic in Russian, but it wasn't it wasn't like some permanent, eternal thing. It's secondary. So the question becomes then, if these large systems come from small systems, what about Old Chinese? Do we have to assume that the 36 constants are, there, are just there forever from Sam Tibetan? I don't know. Maybe, there, maybe Old Chinese was like classical Arabic and had a few core in fact, and things just grew and grew and grew. Or maybe it had no in fact originally. I came up with a hypothesis that in early old Chinese, there were few or no true emphatics, and that emphasis was predictable on the basis of something I'll call X. In a later stage of Chinese, corresponding to the backs of cigar reconstruction, X is partly or wholly gone. Once the conditioning factor starts to vanish, Think something else may become phonemic. And in that case, it was emphasis. So we have this huge constant inventory now. These consonants, in turn, influenced the following vowels. And so vowel allophones developed after consonants. In the final phase of Old Chinese, let's say in Han times, emphasis is starting to vanish, and the bent vowel allophones come into their own and become phonemic. And this, is, and this in turn, results in the very complex Che Yun system of rhymes. So what was X? There's an undeniable trend toward words get toward word structure getting <coughs> squished in the in 
the East and Southeast Asian region. Dax and Cigar is old Chinese assessed for syllabic, meaning that the word structure is one and a half syllables. The half syllable is maximally a, a consonant and a schwa. Schwa is the only possible vowel in what's called a pre-syllable. Modern Chinese is so-called monosyllabic. Yes, we can argue about that, but it's, this is pretty much gone. And this kind of reduction can also be found in other languages of the area. Given that emphasis was located on the initial constant of the main syllable, I thought that maybe X must be near that initial to cause it to become emphatic. What if it, so my hypothesis is this. What if emphatics are traces of lost vocalic distinctions in pre-syllables, which are right before initials? I see emphatics as a step in the progression between disyllables and monosyllables in Chinese language history. This is, this is now really going on in the limb here and being very dangerous. Let's suppose that in very early Chinese, you can call it proto-Chinese, pre-Chinese, whatever, they were actual real disyllables, not sesquisyllables. And over time, the first syllables started to lose their distinctions and fell into two categories. We'll call them which the type A and the B category. The type A category is typified by a low vowel, short A, and the type B category is typified by a high vowel, short U. In Middle Chinese, which is equivalent to the Baxter Cigaro construction, the short A triggered emphasis and the short U did not. These vowels either merged into schwa or were lost entirely, or even the, the pre-syllable just fell off. But the quality of the vowel can be determined by looking at the quality of the consonant. Why do I pick low vowels as conditioning emphasis? Some consider low a ah as a syllabic form of a pharyngeal glide. In Salish, the pharyngeal lo is a syllabic allophone of a. Ah. And in Chinese Arabic, low a conditions pharyngeal allophones. This is the most important for our purposes, I think. The spreading of emphasis <coughs> is in accordance with area of trends. I've been talking about a low high distinction, low a versus high e. There are low high vowel systems throughout this region. There's a lot of harmony in Eurasia of feature spreading. I'm going to skip that. And if we look at disyllabic morphemes in Old Chinese, and these are attested. This is not my hypothetical super Old Chinese. You can see a lot of emphatic harmony. I call these type AA words and type BB words based on the type of each syllable. My thinking is, is that what we're seeing here is the same, is the same kind of harmony that would be in syllables, but on a bigger scale. You find harmony in reduplication. And I've compiled statistics in a 2008 article that I, pub that I published. Now, it is true that not all disyllabic words all fit into these patterns. And in these cases, I wonder if they are loan words or compounds that have become opaque over time. Now, I'm going to conclude with um, some potential issues for <coughs> what I'll call the extended emphatic theory. I, I consider Norman's theory to be the, the base, the original emphatic theory minus the extended version, the overextended version, possibly. Well, one problem is this. If I can supposedly reconstruct vowel qualities based on emphatic em emphasis, why is it that we have cases like this, where the low vowel that my theory predicts seems to correspond to a high vowel in a possibly related word? This is not good for me. <laughs> 
I could come up with some kind of ad hoc solution and make this work, but I'd rather not. This is rather troubling. Of course, one could just, just throw this entirely away and just say, well, the oxygenation word is just a complete lookalike, but I'm not so sure. I'm not, by the way, 100% endorsing Sino-Austronesian here. I'm just saying that, that this could be a loan word, this could be an area word, I have no idea. But I don't think this is coincidental. And this is not the only case. There are others that my theory fails to account for. Another problem is, if my theory is correct, supposedly you might be able to determine vowel qualities of prefixes. I have failed to do this. I, I haven't even tried to do this. And frankly, I'm a little scared. But if I'm correct, this should be possible. Another problem is trying to explain type AB doublets. I've come up with ad hoc solutions like this one, but I don't find them entirely convincing. To, to prove this particular ad hoc solution, I'd have to demonstrate that in every case of the body part prefix, I can make it work with a high vowel presyllable. And I'll just conclude by saying that I could try to extend my impact here even further. Um, for the last decade or so, I've been doing a lot of work on Tangut, and I suspect that Tangut may have also have had a type A to B distinction, but whether it has a similar origin is something I'm not sure about yet. And that's it. And I don't think we have time for questions, except maybe at lunch or something.